May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. A part of the reason why I work so much on my consciousness is so that I can make contact with <laughs> beings from another, you know, from other dimensions. See, uh, because you're using the word consciousness, let me say this. So there are many aspects to who you are right now. There is a body, physical body, which is an accumulation. The food that we've eaten has consolidated itself like this. There is a mental body, mind is not just here, it's across the body. Every cell in the body has its own intelligence and enormous amount of memory, isn't it? Every cell in your body remembers trillion times more than what your conscious mind can remember. Because it remembers your forefathers. Your cells must be having some trouble because of so many different origins <laughs> But still, your body is not confused. It remembers perfectly well, exactly. Confusion can happen in your head, but no cell in your body is confused. All that memory is perfectly preserved, isn't it? The imprints of million years. So there is a mental body. We call this manomaya kosha, that means there's a whole mental body. So this is hardware, that is software. <laughs> you may have good hardware, you may have good software, but if you don't plug it into quality power, both these things are as good as stones, isn't it? So the third dimension is referred to as pranamaya kosha or the energy body. There's an underlying energy body. So the whole work of yoga is to handle the energy body in such a way, because if your energy body is done in a certain way, your physical and mental body will only be a reflection of that. If there are no problems in your energy body, there shall be no problems in your physical or your mental bodies. Right now, the problem with the modern world is this, they're trying to fix the physical body, they're trying to fix the mental body, no any kind of thing with the energetic system. So these three are physical in nature. Physical body is absolutely physical, even mental body is physical, even energy body is physical, but they have very subtle physicality. The next dimension of your body is called as vigyanamaya kosha. That means it's a transitory body. It is not a body that you can perceive with five senses. See, anything that's physical, you can perceive by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. Anything that's not physical, you cannot see it, you cannot touch it, you cannot feel it, you cannot smell it, you cannot hear it. So that's why even if it's right here, you will not know it. That doesn't mean there is nothing here, there are a whole lot of stuff here, but you don't feel it because these five senses are no use for those purposes. These five senses are wonderful for survival. It gives you a picture. If your eyes did not work, you would walk into the water, all right <laughs> not walk upon the water like you were expecting me to do. <laughs> I was hoping you still will <laughs> <laughs> Because if I… I can walk on the water, but then where shall I swim? I won't do such a foolish thing <laughs> So the fourth dimension is transitory, it's called Vijnanamaya Kosha. Transitory means from physical, it's becoming non-physical. The fifth dimension of your body is called Anandamaya Kosha. It is purely non-physical in nature. If something is non-physical, how would you define it? I don't know that I could. You cannot, because only if there is some kind of, you know, mm -hmm. boundary, you can define, you can say, oh, this is a woman, this is a man, this is a house, because there is a boundary. If there is no boundary, how do you define it? There is no definition. So, there is no definition, there is no way to describe it. Because of that, we speak of it from our experience. So, we call it Anandamaya Kosha, which means the bliss body. This doesn't mean a bubble of bliss is sitting within you, it's non-physical in nature, but whenever we touch it, we become blissful. Because of that, 
like a ch it's a child's language. In a, you know, in America it's in use. For example, these are speakers, but you know, some time ago, people would be carrying big uh, tape recorders on their shoulders, listening to the music when there were no headphones and stuff. They called it a boombox. Yes. Okay. <laughs> because it's… it's a child's language, it's doing boom, boom, so it's a boombox. <laughs> yes. So, because whenever we touch this, we become blissful, so it's the bliss body, because we don't know how to define it. Mm. Something that's non-physical, not only doesn't have a boundary, also doesn't have a quantity, isn't it? Right. So, as we sit here, this is my body, that's your body. This is my mind, that's your mind. They will never be one. That is your body, this is my body. Till they bury us, we are not going to be one. I would love to ask you about your relationship with motorcycles <laughs> because I find this so fascinating. I, it's not every day that you see um, a yogi on a motorcycle <laughs> and, and then finding practices, you know, or, or learning l valuable lessons through it. What drew you to motorcycles and what did you learn from it? I started riding small scooters and motorcycles when I was twelve. Yes. It was not legal, but still, it is not motorcycle per se. If you were walking, you could cover only that much terrain. If you were on a motorcycle, it took you away. Like I was just saying, it's not about freedom, it's about the ropes. So legs were ropes, so bicycle became freedom. Once you saw a motorized bicycle, naturally, you went for that, <laughs> all right? right. <laughs> so, as I said, I crisscrossed India on my motorcycle at that time. But after that, things happened when I was twenty-five, this whole thing exploded, my myth of who I am, my individuality exploded and completely I lost everything. One afternoon, I went up the hill, a small hill in Mysore. Are you familiar with India? No. No. You should come. Well, I have been, but I didn't get to spend too much time there. There is a city called Mysore in the south. So, that's where I grew up. So, there's a small hill. Generally, this is the thing there, at least at that time, the tradition in the hilly in Mysore city is. If you… Uh, if you want to test our motorcycles, of course, we go up Chamundi Hill. If you want to camp, we go up Chamundi Hill. We want to party, we go up Chamundi Hill. We fall in love, we go up Chamundi Hill. If we fall out, we have to go up Chamundi Hill. If you have nothing to do, you go up Chamundi Hill. So one afternoon, between two business meetings, I had nothing to do. So not even thinking about it, I just rode up Chamundi Hill, parked my motorcycle, went up and sat on a rock that was familiar to me. Suddenly for the first time, I did not know really who… what is me and what is not me. What was me was just all over the place. And I couldn't figure out what's happening to me. And I was… every cell in my body was dripping ecstasy, bursting with ecstasy. I don't know what was happening to me, I thought this lasted for ten, fifteen minutes, but when I came back to my normal senses, it was about four and a half hours. I was sitting right there, eyes open. It was 3.30 in the afternoon when I sat there, sun had set, it had become dark. But for the first time in my adult life, tears, me and tears were impossible. I live like this, but tears to a point my shirt is all wet. So when I ask my super skeptical mind, what is happening to me? The only thing that my mind could tell me is maybe you're going off your rocker. But within myself, I knew I've hit a gold mine. I don't know what it is, but I knew this is not something to be lost. So when I shared with my closest friends that something like this is happening to me, but just close my eyes, I'm just gone. I said, hey, come on, what did you drink? Come on, what did you pop? Where did you get it? <laughs> well, this is all I got. So suddenly I realized there was no context in the society around me as to what was happening to me. Nobody knew what was happening to me. People, my family started looking at me with some concern because suddenly, you know, the shape of my face was changing, my eyes changed, my voice changed, 
within matter of three, four weeks, my gait changed. Even if I tried to walk the way I was walking earlier, I couldn't walk. Suddenly my gait changed, everything changed. And lifetimes of memory just descended on me in such a way that it became a bit challenging to be with the people who were around me, my family, my friends, my work. I was... by then, within five years, I was known as a very successful entrepreneur, having half a dozen businesses going. I just couldn't go there anymore. I went there one day and I just sat there for some negotiation. Then I saw whatever I think, all these guys are agreeing to me, even though it's not good for them. That's the day I decided I will never sit for any negotiation ever. Even now, even for the yoga center, so much land is being bought, sold, whatever happening, I never sit for any negotiation because if I think something, they will do just that <laughs> So, <laughs> I said, I'll never again sit in a business deal, ever. I've not done that till now and I will not do it. So I just stepped out of my business and traveled around for about a year, year and a half, trying to check out what was coming in my memory, lifetimes of memory. So I traveled just to check if it's true. Though in my mind it was crystal clear, I was such a skeptic, I was trying to somehow prove it wrong. But every bit that I saw was there, I traveled thousands of kilometers across of India, trying to identify those places. After that, there's been no looking back uh, the last thirty-nine years. At that time, I sat down after about maybe a year or maybe a few months. I thought, see, this is fantastic. If I simply sit here and don't mess with my mind, I'm ecstatic, bursting. And I knew this is true with everybody. I tried with a few people and it worked. Then I made a plan. In two and a half years' time, at that time the world's population was 5.6 billion people. In two and a half years' time, I will make the entire humanity ecstatic. I've invented... I've discovered this. Ananda Tirtha, out of his own device and deception, he devised it in such a way that he will always be in Gautama's physical presence. Gautama warned him, this is not good to fix up life like this. You are fixing me up like a wife would fix her husband. Because Ananda Tirtha, being Gautama's elder brother, before he took his monkhood, he put a condition on Gautama. He said, right now I am your elder brother, I can command you to do whatever I want. But once I become your disciple, I will have no such power. So let me exercise this right. And now I am telling you, after I become your monk and your disciple, never should you send me away from your physical presence. I must always be in your physical presence. Never you should say, go there, do that, do this. Always you must keep me next to you. Gautama said, you are trying to fix me up like a wife. Never you should love anybody, never you should do this. This is not good for you. This is not at all in the interest of your well-being. But as an elder brother, you are asking me and if you insist, I will abide by this. But I am telling you, this is not good for you. Ananda said, it doesn't matter, but I must be in your physical presence. He stretched it to ridiculous lengths. This wanting to be in the physical presence of Gautama, he stretched it to ridiculous lengths. It came to a point where after eight years break, Gautama went back to see his wife, who was his wife at least, Yashodara. Yashodara is a very proud woman. Gautama, being her husband at that time, and Yashodara with an infant child, 
Gautama left the house without telling her in the middle of the night like a thief. He did that because he admitted that he did not have the courage to face her. If he looked her in the eye, his determination to go in search of truth may falter. If he looks at his, at his child, when the child is awake and calls him father, his longing to know may falter. So he left in the night. Now he is going back after eight years, a fully enlightened being. But he is sensitive enough to appreciate the emotions of Yashoda, how she would have felt and how she is still angry with what happened to her life. What happened to Gautama's life is fantastic. What happened to Yashoda is not a good thing. He knows that. So he is going there to see what he can offer to her now to compensate for what she has lost in these eight years. So it is a sensitive situation. So he told Ananda, this once relieve me from the promise that I made you. This is not for myself. For me, she is no more my wife, I have grown beyond those things. But for her, I am still her husband who deserted her without telling her, without giving a warning about it. So this is a sensitive emotion for her. She is a proud woman, it is not good for you to be there. Ananda said, you must keep your promise. Gautama bowed down and said, okay. And he took her, took him there also into that situation. When Yeshodara saw that he has come with an assistant monk to face her, she just flew into your age. <laughs> Gautama knew this. He said, this once relieve me of this promise that I made. This is nothing spiritual that you are going to miss anything. This is about my wife. He said, no. Then, towards the end of Gautama's life, Gautama's work created many enlightened beings. But Ananda was still the same man. One service he has done for Aziz, he recorded everything, events that happened according to his understanding. But he recorded everything very diligently. So, people asked, why is he still like this? So many people just came and met you for a moment and they got enlightened. They have transformed themselves in so many ways. But he is always sitting next to you and why is he like this? Gautama just said, a spoon cannot taste the soup. What you refer to as the guru is just a certain energy, a certain possibility. It's not the person. So the physical presence, is it important? It is very important. But the physical need not mean the physical body. The grace is not an airy thing, we can make it very physical. It's as physical as the breeze that you feel, it's as physical as the sunlight. Initially, when a person is just beginning to become receptive, being in the physical presence of the guru becomes very essential because your way of perception is only seeing and hearing and five senses. Because of this, you want to hold him in your eye, you want to hold him in your ears. This is the way you know he is there. Yes, it is a necessity in the beginning, but you need not remain there all the time. 
he will be very physical. Without any negativity, without any negative thoughts bringing down the intensity of the thought process, the first and foremost thing is, you must be clear what is it that you really want. If you do not know what you want, the question of creating it doesn't arise. If you look at what you really want, what every human being wants is, he wants to live joyfully, he wants to live peacefully. In terms of its relationships, he wants it to be loving and affectionate. Or in other words, all that any human being is seeking for is pleasantness within himself, pleasantness around him. This pleasantness, if it happens in our body, we call this health and pleasure. If it happens in our mind, we call this peace and joy. If it happens in our emotion, we call this love and compassion. If it happens in our energy, we call this blissfulness and ecstasy. This is all that a human being is looking for. Whether he is going to his office to work, he wants to make money, build a career, build a family, he sits in the bar, sits in the temple, he is still looking for the same thing. Pleasantness within, pleasantness around. If this is what we want to create, I think it's time we addressed it directly and commit ourselves to creating it. So you want to create yourself and it has tremendous memory. If I open this water, even without opening, if I say something to this water, it remembers. There has been lot of experiments in this direction. So, uh, if you take this water, from wherever the waterworks is and pump it to your house. Let's say it went through fifty bends, forced, pumped forcefully with a certain force, which naturally is done. And you are living on twelfth floor of the apartment, so further forced up. Now they are saying, if it goes through fifty bends, about sixty percent of the water has turned poisonous. Immediately when it comes in the tap, if you take it and immediately drink it, it will work as poison in your system. If you take it and hold it for some time, it will undo itself again. Because the poisoning is not chemical, it is molecular. Molecular changes are happening, no chemical change is happening. This is why traditionally your grandmother always told you, always you must gather the water, keep it overnight in your house, in a properly cleaned vessel with vibhuti and kunkum on it and one flower on it. Yes or no? In traditional homes, only tomorrow morning you drink it. Not as soon as it comes inside your house, you don't drink it because it carries all kinds of memories. In very traditional homes, people every day do puja to the water pot. Yes? and you never drink the water as soon as it comes, you keep it, give it enough time to undo itself from whatever nonsense it has gathered so that it is suitable for you when you drink it. Water you must take care because it's seventy-two percent. It's more, it's first class, you know, more than passing mark. Next thing is food because that's the earth, twelve percent, still substantial, isn't it? So how food goes into you, from whose hands it comes to you, how you eat it, how you approach it, all these things are important. Then comes your air, six percent. In that six percent, only one percent or less is your breath. Rest is happening in so many other ways. And it's important, especially if you have children, at least once a month, take them out somewhere, not to the damn cinema, again breathing everybody's nonsense. <laughs> the air gets affected just by the sounds and the intentions and the emotions, all the rubbish that's happening on the screen and all the rubbish that's reflecting in human minds of violence, of sex, of greed, of this and that, is affecting that limited air in that hall in a tremendous way. So instead of taking them to the cinema, take them to the river, teach them how to swim, 
climb a mountain, where is mountain Sadhguru? Himalayas is so far away. Even a small hill is a mountain for your boy. Yes? Even a little rock, just go climb and sit on one of them. Children will enjoy it immensely, they will become fit, you will become fit. And above all, your body and mind will function differently. And above all, you are in touch with the creator's creation, which is the most important thing. Not your own rubbish that you made, yes it's comfortable right now, but it's not everything. So instead of going to the restaurant, instead of going to the cinema, instead of going somewhere else like that, at least once a month, it doesn't cost anything. Huh? Doesn't cost anything. You can take your rice and aukai and go and eat there. <laughs> anyway you have it, you don't have to spend money on this. Even better, if you don't want to spend money even on the bus or car, all of you cycle, just three kilometers, five kilometers outside Hyderabad, sit on one rock, just spend time there, feel the sun, it's very important you get some sun, air, good water, come back, you are doing Bhuta Shuddhi in a very natural way. It is not the ultimate type of Bhuta Shuddhi, but you are doing some Bhuta Shuddhi. This is what I was saying just now, if you take care of food, water, air is not always in your hands because you're living in a city. But water and food you can take care. And what kind of fire burns within you, that also you can take care. Sunlight has not become impure, isn't it? Get some sunlight every day, please. Get some sun on your body every day because sunlight is still pure, isn't it? Nobody can fortunately contaminate it. And what kind of fire burns within you? Is it the fire of greed, fire of hatred, fire of resentment, fire of anger, fire of love, fire of compassion? What kind of fire burns within you? You take care of that, then you don't worry about your physical and mental well-being, it's taken care of. Yes or no? There are joyful people and miserable people, but there are no good people and bad people. Mm, that's big. <laughs> the, the moment we think we are good, we are entitled to destroy the bad, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we've been destroying a lot of people for a long time. Time to stop that <laughs> because Human beings are in different levels of experience and understanding, variety of people. Anybody who is not like you is obviously bad, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it so? Those who are not like me must be bad people. Because the basis of goodness and what you think is goodness is decided by you. No, you have no business to do that. Willing means this, I'm just willing. I'm a hundred percent yes to life. I am not yes to this one, no to this one, no. I am just yes and yes to life. If you are a hundred percent yes to life, you are a volunteer. Oh, that's you have become a willing life. You have become so willing that you have no will of your own. People ask me, Sadhguru, how do you operate with all these people? All kinds of horrible questions they're asking, they're doing this, they're doing that. I said, my life is not about them, it's about me. Mm. It's about how I am. It's about me. It doesn't matter how they are, that's their choice. But how I am is my choice, this is my way. No matter what they do, I'm like this because I have not given that freedom to anybody, that somebody can freak me, somebody can make me angry, somebody can make me happy, somebody can make me unhappy, these privileges I kept to myself. It's time you do that too, because if somebody else can decide what can happen within you right now, isn't this the ultimate slavery? Huh? Isn't this? Someone else can decide what should happen within you. What happens around you, of course, so many people decide, hmm? 
what happens around us is not hundred percent ours, but what happens within me must be my making, isn't it? Right now, just about anybody can freak anybody because they're not volunteers, they're unwilling. Volunteering means you have no will of your own, you can do whatever is needed. You know, we are a volunteer organization, this means uh, all kinds of people. <laughs> Most of them are not qualified for the jobs that they're doing <laughs> And I cannot fire them because they're volunteers <laughs> <laughs> so people keep coming up to me on a daily basis, they say, Sadhguru, I can't work with this person, she's so horrible, I can't do it. I tell them, see, in this world, this is the sort of people who exist, like this, like this, like this, like this, this is the kind of people there are. But if you want to work with ideal people, you must go to heaven <laughs> and today. Today. But if you think what you're doing is very significant, you must learn to work with all these horrible people. This is how the world is. If you think what you're doing is very significant, you learn to work with all kinds of people. You will see horrible people will do wonderful things. Yes? Yes, yes. But if you want to work with ideal people, you won't find any. I haven't found one yet. Yeah, all kinds of mixed bags, yes. but <laughs> if you are willing that you are not yes and no, yes to one, no to another, you're simply one big yes, you will find a way. <laughs> Thank you so much. That I, I, I always say that it's the resistance. <laughs> Just do this one simple exercise. If you do this, you will live a worthwhile life, believe me. If you sleep in that condition, you will wake up with much more light, with much more energy. Generally, in India they told you, you should not put your head to the north and sleep. Hmm? You're aware of this? If you put your head to the north and sleep, during the night when you… when you're in horizontal positions, then slowly the blood will get pulled towards your brain. When there's too much circulation in the brain, you cannot sleep peacefully. If you have any kind of, you know, inherently weak aspects in your brain or if you're of old age, you could die in your sleep one can have hemorrhage because extra blood is trying to enter the brain where the blood vessels are hair-like. Something extra is being pushed because of the magnetic pull. When you're in a vertical position, this is not so. The moment you become horizontal, this pull on the head is so strong that slowly the blood tries to move towards the brain. So to avoid this, this is true only in the northern hemisphere. If you go to Australia, you should not put your head to the south. If you're in India, you should not put your head to the north. You can put it any other way, it's okay. You were not just taught a practice, it was introduced into your system, it was implanted in your system. So whatever, if there is a live seed within you, if you're awake at Brahma Mahartam and sit for whatever that practice is, it bears maximum fruit because of the way the planet is behaving in relation to your system. If you become aware in a certain way, a certain level of awareness is achieved within you, you will see, you will simply know when that time is. If you go to bed at the right time, you don't have to look at your watch. You will always know when it is 3.40. 
because the body will behave in a different way. At that time, if you sit up and do whatever process you have been initiated for, not what you picked up from a book, it will bear maximum fruit. The seed will get the necessary support at that time for it to sprout or spurt up more rapidly than, you, and than at other times. This is only for the initiated. If you are not initiated, you are a book yogi, then 340, 640, 740, not so much of a difference. Sandhya colors are more important for such people. Sandhya means twenty minutes before sunrise, twenty minutes after sunrise, or twenty minutes before sunset and twenty minutes after sunset. The same goes for noon and midnight, but they are of a different nature. So these two twilights, are better for the uninitiated. 340 is good for those who have been powerfully initiated. You can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. This is getting too easy, just sleeping sadhana. So coming awake to an alarm bell with a sudden start is not the best way to do your life. How many of you find uh, that one day morning when you get up without any reason, you're just feeling ugly for no reason? If it is happening even at least two, three times a year, if it is, then you must do certain things before you go to bed, it's very, very important. Because unconsciously, you need to understand this, you can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. Either pleasantness or unpleasantness, you can incubate very effectively, uninterrupted in sleep. You can also incubate it in the day, but there are so many interruptions, it doesn't happen very efficiently. But if you have a tendency to go to bed in a certain way and you wake up in the morning really nasty for simply no reason, that means you are incubating things in the night very efficiently. Bad eggs. This is not just about psychological disturbances, it can cause major physiological problems over a period of time. It's, it's important that you eliminate these things from your life. So before you go to bed in the night, there are certain things that you need to take care of. It's best if you're eating meat and other kinds of meals, you eat at least three to four hours before you go to bed. The digestion is over. Before going to bed, drink a certain amount of water and go to bed. You will see it gets taken care of just like this. One simple thing can be just a shower, always to shower before go to bed, it'll make a lot of difference. In this weather, maybe cold showers are difficult, so you go for lukewarm showers, don't go for hot showers in the night, go for lukewarm showers, it makes you alert. So you will think, oh, I cannot sleep. It doesn't matter, you will sleep fifteen, twenty minutes or half an hour later, but you will sleep better because it will take away certain things. When you shower, it is not just the dirt on the skin that you're taking away. Have you noticed if you're very tense and anxious, whatever, just a shower, you came out and feels like almost the burden has been taken away from you? Have you not noticed this? So it's not just about washing the skin, a whole lot of things happen when water flows over your body. This shower is a very rudimentary bhuti shuddhi because over seventy percent of your body is actually water. If you run water over it, a certain purification happens which is beyond cleaning the skin.
Visionary Women is a volunteer-run uh, organization, and I know that every single person who is here is giving their time to one organization or another. And the fact that you have nine million volunteers, and you were talking about the relationship between volunteerism and willingness, and that it's through willingness that you uplift your consciousness, if I'm quoting you correctly, or I'm understanding it. In some ways, talking about how it could be a doorway to becoming a bigger person than mm -hmm. who you are. See, uh, before we come to women, first thing is visionary. What a vision, and vision means is, see everybody has desires. Desire is an incre incremental way of enhancing our life. Today you desire, I must have a home, tomorrow you desire, I must have this money, tomorrow you desire something else. These are incremental ways of arranging and rearranging our lives, mm -hmm. which are needed to do a few things. When you say, I'm a visionary, what you're saying is, I have a larger desire, which is not about just incremental improvement of my life. Desire is about me always. Vision is an all-inclusive all process. So, this itself is a phenomenal thing. If people, instead of having desires, if they have a vision, mm -hmm. vision is always all-inclusive. Desire is personal. Desire leads to incremental changes and improvements. Vision can transform the whole situation. I like music <laughs> So, uh, about willingness, because you said you're a volunteer organization, to be a volunteer. A volunteer means somebody who is doing something willingly, right? There's no other compulsion. There are no financial compulsions, there are no social compulsions, there is no something else. You want to do something willingly. So when you're a willing participant right now, you're a volunteer. I'm asking all of you, right now, are you compelled to be here or are you here voluntarily? Oh, well, thank you <laughs> Because I've sp spoken to conscripted people also. What means focus to you and which way can we apply focus in our daily life? So what's your definition of focus? Okay. Uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference, there is… there are nuances to it. But when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man because you kept him in darkness there in the hall <laughs> But if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I'm attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I'm talking about, attention not even about something, just being attentive because only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist, all that's happened is there is no attention, because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. 